Tuesday, August 11th, 2015. The time is 10 a.m. It's my pleasure to call the order of the State of Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmer. Ms. Lisa Mosley, will you please call the roll? Mark Cawthorn? Here. Robert Helms? Here. David Neal? Here. W.T. Patterson? Jane Gray Sal? Here. Robert Starkey? Here. Anita Taylor? Here. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. We have a quorum. We'll continue the meeting as planned. We'll now adopt the agenda. So move. Second. second. Have a motion from Ms. Taylor and a second from Mr. Neal. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we will now. Uh, review the minutes uh, from the June 9th, 2015 board meeting. President, board members, the only thing is added to the draft that was sent to you earlier was the update about the Kentucky courtesy cards and the update on Snow Funeral Home at the last meeting. That was added to what was sent to you previously. Other than that, it was just a correction of typos or things like that. Move to accept the minutes as presented. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Sow and a second from Ms. <coughs> Taylor. All in favor? Aye. Uh, minutes carry. Uh, next item on our agenda is an informal hearing regarding a summary suspension. Since the representative for the respondent is not here yet, my suggestion is to postpone that until later in the meeting. To see if he or shows up. Well, we can either wait or we can do my legal report first, however, the board wishes to proceed. Oh, why don't we continue with the legal report then from Richardson? Um, the first case, it's a three-part case, um, case number 2015-001201, case number 2015-001491, and 2015-001492. And that is two incidents against the unlicensed establishment and then one against the second establishment. Complainant is a member of Funeral Consumers Alliance, and as a member, she received a call from a hospice social worker who had heard of her and was looking for help out of concern that an elderly woman was being taken advantage of after her husband's death. The deceased's wife was charged $1,400 for a bare bones cremation that was listed on respondent's website as only being $695. Respondent would not give his name and did not state an address. Research revealed that they are based in Florida, but only have a funeral license in Colorado. Respondent kept pushing the hospice nurse for the consumer's bank routing number and requested the, the wife's social security number, even though it was her husband who was deceased. Respondent requested a cashier's check, asked for multiple credit card numbers, her bank routing number, and even asked for her driver's license number. The wife canceled her credit card out of fear of fraudulent activity. Respondent avoided calls and did not answer once the nurse voiced her concerns about the business. However, when the nurse called from a different phone number, a respondent answered immediately. The wife of the deceased eventually used another establishment for the cremation. The body was left at the hospice for over six hours after a respondent stated that it would come and pick up the body. Additionally, the wife signed a cremation authorization form and faxed it back to a respondent that is not approved by the board. Research revealed that respondent goes by multiple establishment names and has multiple websites that respondent uses to solicit business in Tennessee even though it has no physical address here and no licensed funeral directors. The websites purport to show that respondent is a local establishment in the town. In another instance, another consumer made funeral arrangements with respondent. The hospital called the consumer because the body had not been picked up in five days. When the hospital employee contacted respondent, respondent stated that it arranged a pickup through a second establishment. The second establishment responded by saying that they had never agreed to the pickup and had nothing to do with the matter. 
The consumer also believed the company to be local to the area and did not realize that they were located out of state. Respondent states that the price range listed on his website is $695 up to $1,395, and the actual price varies on the geographic location of where the passing occurs. Respondent denies that any of his employees would ask for bank routing information or social security numbers. Respondent denies all other allegations and states that it never received any payment or completed the arrangements in these cases. Respondent states that, is that it is merely a referral organization and does not need to be licensed because it contracts with licensed establishments to provide the funeral services. Respondent has also stated that he will not stop his activities no matter how much civil penalties we levy against him and his business. And so because he has told us that he will not stop no matter what the board does, my recommendation would be to refer to the Attorney General's office for injunctive and any other available relief. And for the second establishment, since there is no evidence that they were actually involved, my recommendation is to close. Move to accept counsel's recommendation. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Sow, a second from Mr. Neal. All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Is this not who we dealt with before? Operating under a different establishment name, but for our research reveals it's the same individuals. All right, the next case is case number 2015-004351. Complaint states that deceased caretaker made the arrangements with respondent for cremation. The siblings were not notified and did not have any part in the decisions, and they are now stuck with a bill that they did not create. An investigation revealed that the caretaker had power of attorney over the deceased, and both he and the hospital told respondent that there was no family, no other family. The caretaker would not pay, stating he did not have any money, and he finally stopped returning respondent's calls. A policeman called and told respondent that the deceased had sisters who were looking for their sister's remains. Both the sisters knew the deceased wished to be cremated and, have, and had no problem with the arrangements the caretaker had made. The sisters agreed to pay for the cremation in installments. Respondent forgave the balance in January after $500 was, $500, excuse me, was paid right before the business was sold and the oldest sister took the cremains. Both the sisters stated that respondent told them that they could not receive the cremains until the bill was paid in full. Respondent states that they did not pick up the cremains because the sisters could not decide who would take them. So the violation would be unreasonably refusing to surrender custo custody of the cremains, um, but since that the establishment has since changed hands, my recommendation would be to close the letter of warning to the former manager of the business before it was sold. Motion to accept. Second. May I ask a question? <coughs> the firm is now under different ownership? Yes, and the former manager no longer works there. Um, she's currently not working for any funeral establishment. But she is that person licensed? Yes. Was she not in violation? The violation would be unreasonably refusing to surrender custody, yes. She's not still in violation with her, I mean, she was a licensed funeral director. She's the one that did it. Should, should she not still be charged? If the board wishes to um, assess civil penalty ab against that manager, the board can do so. Is that, li is that license still active, Mr. Grimm? Yes. Is she practicing anywhere else? Not to my knowledge, not since the business was sold. It's my understanding she's probably working in a uh, another profession other than funeral service. Other questions, Miss Al? But certainly not the. It, it's not the violation of the <coughs> current owner <coughs> or manager, but violation still there. Evidence. But if she's oh, not. Sorry. 
Yeah, the well, evidence we have is both the sisters stated that that's what they were told, and that's why they couldn't take the cremains until January. Um, so if the board wishes to assess something more serious, they can. Proper recommendation or you wouldn't have done it, right? Based on the circumstances and that she's currently, since change of ownership and she was currently not working, that was my recommendation. Okay. I have a motion from Mr. Hams and a second from Mr. Cochran. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next case is case number 2015-008501 and 2015-008502. Complainant was a former employee of respondent for about three months. Complainant states that during this time the respondent sexually harassed her. He constantly tried to kiss her and touch her and he said extremely lewd and rude sexual comments. He said that he would pay for her funeral director's license and that he would set up a place for her to stay in Nashville when she attended Gupton. When she inquired about going, he told her that she would be staying with him and not boarding. When she refused, he fired her. Respondent denies the allegations in full. A thorough investigation did not reveal any evidence of sexual harassment. So my recommendation would be to close due to lack of evidence and send a letter to the complainant explaining the decision. Motion to accept. May I ask a question? Oh, does the uh, complainant have any witnesses that could verify that what she said is true? No, we interviewed every employee at this establishment, and none of them corroborated her story. She fired. There were a couple, I'm not sure exactly how she ended it, whether she was fired or left, but it was rough towards the end. But there's no evidence in anything she said is true. I could not find any evidence supporting it. But we did, at the beginning of the complaint, send her a letter giving her other agencies that were more appropriate to report sexual harassment to as well. So she does have those agencies. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Cochran, a second from Mr. Neal. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Motion carries. The next case is case zero or case number two zero one five zero zero eight seven six one. Daughter of the deceased was not involved in the arrangements and was not given a copy of the insurance policy, so she is unsure whether she was a beneficiary or not. An investigation revealed that the daughter was with the deceased when he died and signed the embalming authorization form when the funeral home representative came to pick up the body. Respondent then had no further communication with her until she came to the services and later when she asked for a copy of the death certificate. Respondent did not give her a copy of the death certificate, stating it was their policy to only give death certificates to the ones who make arrangements and pay for the services. The daughter wanted to have a say in the arrangements but was not given any information. The deceased son made the arrangements and paid for the services. The deceased had two daughters who were not involved in the arrangements at all. And the violation would be the right to control disposition, um, TCA 625703. If there is more than one child of the decedent, the majority of the surviving children have to make the arrangements. Since there were three and only one of the children were involved, my recommendation was a consent order with a $1,000 civil penalty Investigation costs of $312.50 and authorization for a hearing. Do we know if these uh, two daughters offered to pay for the funeral bill or was it strictly the brother paying for it? I'm not sure about how the arrangements. The respondent on the funeral establishment responded saying that he was the one paying so he was the only one they spoke with and dealt with. And she said that she, she didn't say anything about payment with, I don't know whether she had the resources to or not, but Did she, she had contacted the establishment multiple times to be involved <coughs> and they did not let her. Do we know who the beneficiary of the insurance was? It does look like it was the son. 
Um, and it looks like that insurance policy is what paid for the services. Why is the penalty so high? This is common. If the brother comes and makes the arrangement, he's paying. That's who I look for. Well, I thought it was high because the right to control disposition should be with the majority of the children, and the two daughters were completely shut out of the process. But what I'm asking is why the fine is so high. I can't see the fine being this high. I, I can't see the funeral director did anything wrong. Okay, well, I, I thought it was egregious to completely shut out the two daughters. If the board disagrees, then they can they can lower the civil penalty since you're more familiar with these types of situations. Sometimes we, we don't know what the family relations are, and we don't know that there's discord in the family. Uh, I think it's kind of high, too, because sometimes they don't want to come to the conference. And so... It's after the fact, they say. Right, they it's after involved. the fact. And then usually... Even if they're in there and they're trying to make decisions, they have no money. And so it still boils down to the one who is either the beneficiary or has the purse strings. So I think it's high, too. What would the board think would be appropriate, then, in this instance? I, don't, I, I personally don't see what they did wrong myself. Close it with a letter of warning. Um, a motion would need to be made. A move. Second. Have a motion from Mr. Ham, second from Mr. Taylor for a letter of warning. And look, excuse me. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carries. The next case is case number 2015 010921. Complainant was not involved in the arrangements for her mother, although she had a power of attorney. Respondent states that he made arrangements with deceased granddaughter, who was in responsible care of the deceased, and did not include complainant because of family issues. The nursing home had banned complainant from the premises because of her outrageous actions. The granddaughter also had a durable power of attorney, and hers was more recent than complainant's. An investigation revealed that respondent spoke with multiple members of the family, who all agreed that the granddaughter would be in charge of the arrangements. When complainant arrived at the funeral home to make arrangements, respondent told her that the deceased son and other family members had told him that the granddaughter was to handle the arrangements and that she should speak with her brother. So my recommendation for this case would be to close. Motion we accept. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Neal, a second from Ms. Taylor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Number 2015-012561. Respondent's establishment license expired on November 30th, 2014 and was not reinstated until February 3rd, 2015. During this time, respondent handled one case. Additionally, respondent's priceless disclosures varied slightly from the language required by the funeral rule. Respondent also had a gas leak, which required part of the ceiling in the chapel to be taken down. This had not been repaired at the time of the inspection. Respondent showed proof that the roof has been repaired. So my recommendation would be a consent order with a civil penalty of $250 and authorization for a hearing. Motion to accept. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Helms, a second from Mr. Neal. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. All right, the next case is case number 2015-012691. 2015-012692 and 2015-012693. Respondent Funeral Director posted on her Facebook page that she started working at Respondent Establishment as the General Manager of Funeral Director and an Embalmer on July 4th, 2014. Respondent did not apply for her Funeral Director and Embalmer's license until August 13th, and she was not, she was not given the licenses on, until October 14th and the establishment has never submitted a request to name respondent as its manager. Respondent states that she accepted the position as manager, funeral director, and embalmer at the establishment, pending her reciprocity license being approved. Respondent states that she posted on her personal Facebook page out of excitement and to inform family and friends. Respondent also states that it was not her intention to be deceptive or misleading. Respondent establishment states that they offered her the job with the contingencies that she could only work as an unlicensed assistant until her reciprocity was granted, and she would only be the manager after the current manager retired, which has not yet occurred. She did not begin work until two weeks after the Facebook post. Respondent also states that they never held her out to the public as their manager. 
So my recommendation would be for the funeral director and embalmer a consent order with civil penalty of $250 in authorization for a hearing and for the establishment to close. Is it, so I got, with it being a personal Facebook page, what, what, what do we base that ruling on? The violations would be, the statute says it's unlawful for an unlicensed person to offer to engage in funeral directing, embalming, or operation of a funeral establishment, misrepresent, misrepresentation and misleading advertising, misleading or deceptive practices. Um, we have not had many cases concerning Facebook. Um, the one we did have a few months ago, he posted like a day or two before his license were granted. So I believe we just gave him a letter of warning. Um, this, since this was months, I thought a civil penalty might be more appropriate. But if the board wishes to decide how they want to handle these Facebook, Facebook cases going forward, I imagine more will come up. Get ready. It's going to happen. I, I mean, I think they. I think she probably should be warned. I mean, just to, hey, be aware. You know, you don't want to mislead folks. But I, I'd, I'm not in favor of a fine on a personal Facebook page. If, if it had been the business establishment, that would have been different. But on her personal page, in my opinion, that would. I would appreciate guidance from the board and how to deal with these cases when but they come. Why up. is it not? It's still unlawful. <laughs> <coughs> It's still a violation of the Tennessee Code. Well, no matter I where it this is. This lady is being hired contingency on being licensed. So, I mean, if she was never licensed, I mean, she put it on her Facebook page. I don't think the funeral home should be. No, I'm, the license, the, the fine should be against her. For the establishment, it said close it. This okay. was about the individual. The fine was to the individual. My recommendation was to close it against the establishment and have a fine against the individual. Oh, the case. Fine. Okay. Against the establishment, yes. Okay, all right, I see. Okay. okay. But, <laughs> and, that was and I guess my thought is even with her, I think it was more that post I, I i don't think was ever intended to be an advertisement for her services that was hey hey everybody i got a new job very you know excited telling her her friends um again i, I don't think it was hey come on down to whatever funeral home and i'll i, I think it was more of an excitement hey i've got a new job is what is the way that i read that mm -hmm. um which is why i have a little bit of a problem finding her for that now again i agree with the letter of warning because they should be aware hey this could be interpreted as advertising your services, so be careful when you post things like this. But I don't think that that was the intention of that post. Also, the way I read the case, you know, she was a licensed funeral director in another state. Yes, she was. So, exactly. so I, I back up Mark on this. Okay. So I, I guess I, I recommend a letter of warning. Close with a letter of warning. Oh, it needs to be a motion. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll make a motion to close with a letter of warning. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion from Mr. Cochran and a second from Mr. Helms for a letter of warning. All in favor? Aye. Uh, um, sorry, I should have caught you before. Um, the motion wasn't clear. A letter of warning against the individual and closure against the establishment. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Motion carries. So can I. Uh, but, excuse me, you didn't ask for a no vote? Hmm? No. Okay. All right, case number 2015-013-071. Complainant establishment states that one of their former employees now works for respondent and copied their web design. Complainant expressed his concern with respondent, but respondent has yet to change their website. Respondent states that the employee in question referred, to the web designer, referred the web designer to respondent. Respondent denies any copyright infringement and a meeting with complainant only addressed issues with brochures, which are not copyrighted. However, since respondent was having trouble with the web designer anyway, to avoid any continuing issues, they decided to hire another firm and are revamping their website. Um, as part of the complaint, there were print-offs of the website of respondent. When I checked on June 17th, the respondent website was down, saying we'll be back soon. I checked again today. Their website is back up. It is more different than it was before. There were a lot of similarities before, and now it is different. Um, 
my recommendation would be a consent or the civil penalty of $250 and authorization for, for a hearing. Exactly what did they violate here? Um, this would just be unprofessional conduct, um, copying websites. It, it was very similar, just different names. And Sometimes you have casket companies mm -hmm. that do a website. And if I'm in the same town he's in, our website can be the same. We use the same casket use company. The same templates. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm unfamiliar with how website design works. So it seemed borderline to me, but if the board wishes to do something else. I think maybe a letter of warning would also yeah. be in this, because like I said, you know, casket companies have the, you know, some company people design. use the same, and they're, yeah. You just you substitute names instead of. <laughs> I'll make a motion that we just use a letter of warning. Okay. I have a motion from Mr. Helms for a letter of warning, second by Ms. Taylor. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Motion carries. All right. The next case is case number two zero one five zero one three three one one. 2015-013312 and 2015-013313. During a change of ownership application, it was discovered that Respondent Apprentice is listed as a part-time employee. Respondent filed quarterly reports attesting that the Apprentice worked 40 hours per week. Respondent Funeral Home states that, th that this listing as a part-time employee was a mistake and arose due to the sale, where the new owners mistakenly listed him as part-time. This has been corrected and respondent states that the apprentice has always been working full time and provides pay stubs showing this. So my recommendation would be to close. Motion to accept. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Taylor, a second from Mr. Neal. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next case is case number 2015 Complainant is a board member of a cemetery and has been fielding calls about respondents' businesses. Respondent recently bought several funeral homes and complainant alleges that the advertising is misleading and that it makes it appear that the former owners are still partners and involved. The complainant states that respondent is using the former names and owners to bolster his business. Complaint also states that respondent does not live in her county and therefore the locally owned advertising is misleading. One of the ads has the photo of the old owner along with the phrase local family ownership, making it appear that the old owner still owns the funeral home. Another ad states that the funeral home has new local owners. There is also a news clip that ran stating that one of the family members from the old local owners is now a partner, which is not true. The individual is a staff member, not a part owner. Respondent states that in the ad with the photograph of the old owner, the old owner works at the funeral home, but the ad does not state that individual is the owner. Respondent has focused on local ownership in his advertisements because he bought the funeral homes back from publicly traded corporations, and he is a local Tennessee owner. My recommendation would be to close. It's consistent with what we've done before. I've never had one quite like this, but I believe so. So the main issue is that he's not local, but he is local, just not, he's regionally local, but not, like he's from Tennessee, but not local to that town. Um, and there was confusion with this one funeral home with the former owner, used to be his family funeral home. He sold it to a publicly traded corporation this respondent bought it back. So now it's local again. And the former owner is now working there, but he is not an owner. The so. problem is the phrase locally owned. Is that the main contention? It appears to be. I would consider this to be locally owned because it's within a couple mile radius. Um, it is a local Tennessee individual who owns these establishments. There's really no definition of how many miles constitutes local that I know of. I 
I'll make a motion to accept council's recommendations. Second. Okay, I'll second. I have a motion from Mr. Cochran, a second from Mr. Hams and Ms. Taylor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. All right, the next case is case number 2015-013561. Inspection revealed that respondent overcharged two families for use of facilities and staff. Respondent charged $1,000 and $1,200 respectively for what should have been either $625 or $800 according to the price list. One of the services that was $200 and listed on the statement of funeral goods and services is not listed on the price list. Respondent states that both the families had a strict budget but could not find any caskets within their budget. Therefore, respondent moved some of the costs over to the services to decrease the, the sales tax load on the families. And my recommendation would be a consent order with civil penalty of $1,000 and referral to the Department of Revenue because that could be considered tax fraud. And also priceless violations. A lot of times, and I think this is, again, maybe you're not being familiar with the funeral business, but even on pre-need situations when there's only so much money there, you know, that even though today's price of a casket is so-and-so, we might revert back to the original price of the casket. So the family, that's a cash advance, the taxes. So they would have to pay additionally if you keep it like the old way, then they wouldn't. So I think this is a common practice now, whether that's skirting on, it's in order to protect the consumer and have to pay more money when they prearranged a funeral a lot right. of times. These were both at need. So when our inspector was there, he did explain that they could discount. They just can't move the prices around to change the sales tax, which is the main problem here. And the price list is different. But he could have discounted. These were both at need. What's the difference here? I'm failing to see the. Because at the end, once he'd added everything up and used the r correct prices from the price list, he could have given them a discount that would have done the same purpose, but it would have, the, all the sales tax would have still gone to the state. Oh, um, just the way he moved the money around is questionable, in my opinion. It's pretty serious when you start circumventing sales tax revenue. It's Move to accept the recommendation, Council. Thank you. I have a motion from uh, Ms. Sow, a second from Mr. Neal. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. All right, the next case I need to bring to you because of a mistake I did. Um, this is case number 2015-002-111. This was presented two months ago. The violation was failure to pay a um, distributor or supplier. And the board had rec had authorize a civil penalty of $500. I sent out the consent order, which he signed, pay the civil penalty, but I made the mistake in only saying the civil penalty was $100. So he accepted it and paid it. It is still open. So my question to you is, because it's still not final until the board approves it. And since I accidentally gave him something that you had not approved, my question was whether you want me to go back and say, no, the board authorized $500, it was my mistake or whether you just want to accept the $100 and move on. Before I went back and got into this with him, I wanted to make sure the board was aware that I had previously sent out something that was incorrect. If, if I miss price a funeral, then I go on and live with it. So I kind of feel like that's this. That's where I'm coming from today. Okay. I think that's something that's that. we're in a financial situation to take care of that. Right, so, so we're covering you. Yeah, so I, I would need a motion to accept the $100 civil penalty. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Taylor, a second from Mr. Hams to uh, accept the $100 as the uh, final payment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. That concludes my case report. At This time we will go back to the informal informal hearing. 
on it regarding a summary suspension. Is oh, there he is. <laughs> Does the board have some more business they can conduct? Sure. We can go. We'll we'll just continue on with our uh, normal agenda. Our next will be our director's report from Mr. Robert Greville, executive director. President and board members, before you today is a preliminary report for the fiscal year that ended June the 30th. Fiscal year that ended June the 30th. We had revenue, according to the preliminary report, of $498,024. Expenditures were $374,254. And cost backs are to be added. Last year, the cost backs were about $150,000. I don't know if they'll be the same this year or if they'll be different to some degree. Of course, typically, every other year, we lose, lose, you know, have a net loss for that year because we have so many licensees who renew on June the 30th of the even numbered years. So the year that just ended, it's typical that we have a loss of revenue. That's been running somewhere around $100,000. But we have a reserve balance as of July the 1st, 2014 of $1,066,326. So whatever the loss ends up being for the fiscal year that just closed on June the 30th would be deducted from the reserve balance of $1,066,000. We're in good shape on that. We're, st we're, still, in, we're still in good shape. Uh, of course, probably in... October, November, somewhere along in there, we'll get a final close for all the um, documentation, and we'll present that to you. And generally, the assistant commissioner and sometimes the deputy commissioner comes and appears before comes and appears before the board to talk with you about that. But I did want to give you some preliminary numbers so that you would. would as a response, as response been to your email about the dues because of the computer it's been, it's been good Earth has been as compared to the other boards Earth has been as good or better percentage wise than the other boards and uh, Miss Mosby and I will talk a little bit more about that uh, toward the end of my report as to why we're doing that now, one thing to keep in mind is you know I mentioned there that the deficit is normally around a hundred thousand this year if we use the same cost back as last year it may be as little as fifty thousand Part of that is because these notices were sent out May the 15th uh, for anybody that renewed through November the 30th because we're going to this new computer system and we're trying to get as many people to renew as that will prior to the August the 31st because we're going to have a period there where it's going to be extremely hard to issue renewals or new licenses for a period of a few days. So that's uh, that's increased our revenue a little bit to what it would normally normally increase it because of those people paying in advance so that means next year revenue will be down but the, on the even numbered years the the uh, net profit is always much more than what the expenses are so i still think we'll be profitable next year where we would get in a real bind is if we have two years in a row two consecutive years where we have a net loss then we're automatic automatically subject to appear before the government um, operations committee uh, Gov ops in the legislature, and I think that also calls for us for a sunset review. So we we for sure don't want to be two year two consecutive years. But our, our our reserve balance is still real good, extremely good. But I did want to make you did want to make you aware of that. As far as the legislative update, of course you're aware of the legislature is adjourned, and really there's no update. If you've got any questions about anything, we'll be glad to. Ms. Richardson and I will be glad to entertain those questions, but there's really not a, we don't have an update prepared. Uh, they'll be back in session in January, and that won't be long. License E report is a report of licenses administratively approved by the executive director pursuant to the board's authority for the period of June 9, 2015 through August 10, 2015. And you have a list of the establishments, their changes, and also the individuals as well. There are no establishments that are reported closing since the last board meeting. 
Disciplinary action is a report of consent orders administratively accepted or approved by the executive director pursuant to the board authority for the period of June 1, 2015 through July 31, 2015. Complaint report uh, for a meeting today. As of yesterday, we had a total of 36 complaints. Keep in mind, some of those complaints do have more than one respondent, so it could be that there's uh, more respondents than there. But as far as complaints, there's one complaint in the apprenticeship, seven as far as funeral director and bombers, and 28 as far as establishments. And then the last thing that we want to talk to the board about is the new licensing system. Uh, on your iPad there are two emails. The uh, first one is one that we sent to all licensees or registrants of either the funeral board or burial <coughs> services. Uh, this is a second notice, so to speak. The first notice is went out, the paper notice went out on May the 15th or soon thereafter. And then this was to go out uh, one day last week to remind them that uh, you know, Department of Commerce and Insurance is working better to serve the licensees and restaurants. We're in the process of updating our online renewal system, and the new system will be more efficient and user-friendly. But due to this upgrade, there'll be a delay in processing renewals between September 1 through 15 of 2015, and this will be applicable to all renewals, both paper and online, and also it will be applicable to, to new license as well. So we're making a push to get everyone to renew online by no later than August the 20, 24th uh, because we want to make sure that as many people as possible get their license renewed. Also we reached out to uh, Mr. Malcolm Butler who is the liaison for the Tennessee State Funeral Director and Morticians Association and to Mr. Bob Batson who is the executive director of the Tennessee Funeral Director Association, and to Ms. Cindy Faree, who is the, the executive director for the Cemetery Association of Tennessee, and ask them if they could to communicate that through their uh, resources as well. And I know that uh, the Tennessee Funeral Director Association sent an email out regarding that, and we got a response from Mr. Butler thanking us for contacting him and making him aware of it. So hopefully, Hopefully we've got most of the people taken care of as far as that. And Ms. Mosby has worked extremely hard with this new licensing system. It's called CORE, C-O-R-E. And uh, I've asked her to uh, make a, a short presentation to the board about the licensing system. Regulatory board is currently upgrading their system from RBS, which stands for Regulatory Board System, to CORE. And CORE actually means Comprehensive Online Regulatory Enforcement. Within the core system, the regulatory boards will have more visibility to each license and registration that each person's hold. And with that being said, if they have multiple licenses throughout the regulatory boards, we'll be able to see that. So if there are any um, issues, we'll be able to address that throughout the, the system. Um, also, the regulatory board, um, we have been in the process over the last two years of migrating information and testing it. We're really thoroughly testing it throughout different phases to make sure everything goes smoothly with the transition. So um, with that being said, we have um, our revenue processing department. That What they're doing is they're processing the payments to make sure that everything goes smoothly payments and with you know checks being cashed and everything to that to that extent the gold live date is tentatively September 9th 2015 that's why mr. Gribble has sent out um, emails pushing for um, everybody to go ahead and renew that has an open transaction during that time so we can have a smooth process because there will be a blackout time from September 1st through the 15th where we won't be able to do any renewals or any applications during that time, unless there's an extreme emergency where we need to get that process. So also, there's one more component to the core system, and that's Versa Online. It's called VO. This will be the online part of the system. And with this, you'll be able to renew your um, license online, and then during the first phase, you'll be able to renew your license online. In the second phase, what they're going to do is do initial applications. 
So instead of sending all the paperwork in like normal, you'll be able to just go online and download your paperwork. So that's the second part of it. Um, that part will come later. We're still right now testing the core and the VO just to make sure all the bugs are worked out. Do you have any questions concerning this? If, if you should get called about, you know, when this goes into effect, if you get calls, ask them to call the office and talk to Ms. Mosby or, or I, either one. We'll be glad to talk to Lysonese about it. it. Obviously, with any new system, it's anticipated there will be some, be some glitches, there will be some problems. But our information systems, IS people, are working extremely hard to eliminate as many of those as possible. So if there's, uh, if there's any, anything that uh, you get called about, if you'll just ask them to call us, we'll be glad to talk to the people and work them through it. And just also as a way of letting you know, um, this I don't know exactly when the effective date of this is, but the department is also instituting a central call area, which will be here in the building, and it will be uh, from people, many people who have worked with the regulatory boards, so they're familiar with them. But to be the first line of defense for the calls coming into the building, and then if it's a a call that's uh, with questions that's not normally asked, then they were con were they're going to continue to refer those to the office. But uh, there may be a time in the next few weeks when you dial the funeral board number that you've been dialing, and it may be answered by by a call center. Uh, and you know, many times people are just asking, you know, what's the cost of renewal? What's uh, general questions? So they'll be prepared to answer those. But if it's something that's uh, subject matter expert. Um, or something like that, then that call will be transferred on to the to the office for us to uh, to uh, talk to the talk to the individual caller. Any also, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, we have a new um, website. So if anybody has any issues with the website and navigating to these um, places, if they can call the office, we'll be happy to let them know. Have a new web address. Same oh, ma address. Still the same. If uh, for the benefit of the people who might be listening to the tape later, if you do not put the www in and just put in funeral tn gov, that's the shortest address to get you there. Funeral tn gov. If you put the www in front of it, it's going to take you somewhere else. So uh, the uh, the state did a complete upgrade on websites and uh, revamped them, and that's been. Uh, been out there for a few few weeks it's still um, people are getting used to navigating through it and it's you know people that use it all the time it's it takes a little little longer but they're getting yes yeah the two letter abbreviation for Tennessee yeah you know dot tn dot gov motion we accept the director's report second have a motion from mr. Neal a second from Ms. Taylor all in favor? Aye. Aye. Report is accepted. Next on the agenda is adopt our meeting schedule for the 216 board year. Present those dates are the second Tuesday of each month. Uh, we present them to you for one each month with the idea that uh, the office will consult with the president and if there's not business to be conducted then that the president might decide to cancel one or two of those meetings or three of them some somewhere throughout the course of the year but we 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 need to go well we've already reserved this room for those dates um, and that's that's there's several things in the background that we need to do ahead of time and then about this time of the year we uh we ask the board to adopt the dates obviously you can change <coughs> those dates if you wish uh we might just be conflicting with someone else about getting a conference room or, or uh, something, but uh, those, are, those dates are the second Tuesday of each month. Okay. Motion? So moved. So second. moved. Have a motion from Ms. Taylor and a second from Mr. Hams. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next on there, well, I'm just going to finish here. Are you?
licensee. There's one one licensee is all there is. Okay. Approval of licensee application. Okay. This is Mr. Brian L. Bloomberg. He's from Wisconsin. He's making an application today for a funeral director and embalmer license by reciprocity. And uh, based on his applications, the board may, among other pertinent statutes and rules, specifically examine TCA 62-5-317 and make a determination as to whether the applicant meets the requirements for licensure. Mr. Brian, if you will, introduce yourself to the board and give them a little bit of information, background information about you. And sure. Uh, Brian Lee Blumenberg. Currently reside in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. I'm born and uh, raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've been uh, licensed as a funeral director and embalmer since 2005 in Wisconsin. The license is combined. Uh, I began my funeral uh, career in 2002 as an apprentice and then got licensed in 2005 and I've been successfully licensed for 10 years now and still currently active and employed. What about Tennessee firm currently? Oh, still, still currently employed in Wisconsin. I still reside in Wisconsin. I will be seeking employment in Tennessee. I just felt it was advantageous to get both the embalmer and director's license before I start uh, submitting resumes. That that would expedite the hiring process a little bit better. Well, have you found everything in order? Yes, sir. Okay. Move approval. Second. Have a motion from Ms. Sow and a second from Mr. Neal for approval. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Mr. Starkey, could we take about a 10 minute recess? Okay. Please? We'll have about a 10 minute recess, folks. Person Insurance Board of Funeral Directors and Bombers back in session. Can we go on and finish before we just adjourn, see if there's any new business to come? Is there any new business to come before the board? Good. We're now ready. Are you ready, Mr. Chief? Yes, sir. Okay. Is everybody here? Nice to be here. Um, I want to tell you what I'm doing here and uh, the purpose of this. A, com a complaint was received, the department received a complaint against Signature Funeral Services LLC on June 26, 2015 from a former employee, uh, former employee of that establishment. Signature Funeral Services LLC, uh, obviously it's an LLC. I believe it's got a single member who is Mr. Eric, Rodney Eric Williams here. Okay, um, and Mr. Williams is also the manager. After conducting the initial review of the complaint, 
the department identified what appeared to be a possible threat to the public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, specifically, the complaint alleged that Signature Funeral Services, which is an establishment that does not have a preparation room, had embalmed dead human bodies on numerous occasions on a break room countertop. Uh, so the department immediately dispatched an investigator, Mr. Roy Bozeman, uh, sent him out to the location to determine whether there was a factual basis for the allegations in the complaint and more importantly, whether there was any evidence to indicate whether or not the unlawful procedures were ongoing in nature. And on that following day, June 27, 2015, the investigator obtained written statements from the complainant as well as some other former employee statements from Mr. Williams and these supported the allegations that unlawful embalmings had taken place on site. However, the reason that I'm here today before formal charges have even been filed, the reason I'm here in advance today is that our investigator, when he went out, he found embalming chemicals and implements both in the cabinet above the break room sink and on the countertop. And the department believed that this evidence might, uh, would be sufficient for the board to make a determination that there was a threat to the public health, safety, and welfare which imperatively required emergency action. So out of an abundance of caution, the department has brought these limited facts to you and uh, to let you make this preliminary determination. And before I get into the details, I want to cover some important points of the aspects of a summary suspension. If you notice on your iPads, Exhibit 4, I've highlighted, uh, I'll wait just a second and make sure you all got that up. Affidavit. No, I mean, exhibit, oh, I'm sorry, exhibit IV for small uh, Roman uh, IV. It's TCA 4-5-320. down through there uh, but go all the way back to your uh, oh, agenda and it's down through there. exhibit what for IV. IV down there oh I beg your pardon yeah Okay, uh, exhibit uh, IV4, 45320, four, you'll notice that I've highlighted a few things in there and I've added some underlines. But this explains, by, under uh, D1 A and B, this statute explains that a summary suspension can be done one of two ways. Either one, notice can be given to the respondent in advance telling the respondent that the board is going to be considering this and let the respondent be here when the board makes that decision and the respondent has an opportunity to present his version to the board. That's one way of doing it and that, that's the way that the department has proceeded with this case. And the other option is, to, is for the board to take summary suspension action and then give the respondent a chance to come in before the board. But anyway, We've done it, we've proceeded under the first, the first option, and I'll direct you toward the, to the bottom of the page where it's highlighted, uh, where it says whether the informal hearing, review, or conference is held before or after an order of summer suspension, the sole issue to be considered is whether the public health, safety, or welfare 
imperatively required emergency action by the agency. So uh, this, this statute provides that this informal meeting that we're having right now, it's informal and as I was explaining to Mr. Williams, that means that the normal rules and statutes regard, regarding administrative hearings don't apply. So we don't have to have an administrative judge here. We don't have to go by the rules of evidence and so forth. Uh, but the trade-off to that is you can only consider whether or not there's an, there's an immediate risk to the public health and safety or welfare. And then I'll direct you towards the top highlighted portion where it says if the agency finds that the public health, safety, or welfare imperatively requ requires emergency action, then the board can incorporate that in its order and uh, that, that becomes effective pending the outcome of, of formal proceedings. So I just want to make sure that we're all on board as far as what uh, is to be considered today and what's not. So going back to <coughs> going back to the facts, Uh, first of all, you'll, you'll notice several affidavits, and those are Exhibit 2, Exhibit 3, Exhibit 4. Exhibit 2 is an affidavit from Gid Holmes, who was a former employee. I believe he worked there from 2013 to 15. Is that right, Mr. Williams? Uh, yes, with a, with a three or four month gap. Between okay. Um, so that, that's his affidavit, and I'll, I'll uh, give you a few minutes to scan through that. <coughs> what we're looking for, uh, again, are, is the issue that would affect public health. So you'll notice in there that he says that there's been embalming procedures done there. Exhibit three is by Jordan Cooper, who is also a former employee. And that exhibit has pretty similar allegations in it. And then there's also exhibit four, which is from Mr. Williams himself. Now, Mr. Williams states in his David affidavit on, on page two of the affidavit, towards the bottom, he, he states that um, no arterial injections were administered, uh, actually towards the top of that page. Um, any alleged embalming in this facility was hypodermically administered for the purpose of the word preserving is marked out and then it says continual storage so you know there he he's admitting to using chemicals to uh, to preserve a body I mean that's whatever he wants to call it, it's, you know, using chemicals. I believe we can skip page three of the affidavit. And then on page five of the affidavit, Mr. Williams states that with regard to the photo, and he's referring to a photo that was in, I believe, the Gid Holmes affidavit of the 
post mortem body that was laying open. This was an isolated incident which was suggested by Get Homes because of the. What page are you on? I'm on page five of five, the affidavit of. It's affidavit four, oh. exhibit four, which is Rodney Williams. I'm on page five of that affidavit. I'm reading Gid. Okay, then you're on <coughs> exhibit two. You'll go back to your library and then exhibit four. I need to be on page five. Right, page five, it, it just that's where he's talking about doing the injections to uh, for the body And I'm sorry that I'm getting out of order here, but <coughs> back on page two of that affidavit, you, you'll see that about the middle, it says aspiration of bodies are necessary on casketed remains from time to time and has been done in this facility, but he says no arterial injections were ever administered so now wait a minute he said no arterial injections were done well that that's what it says is uh aspiration of bodies are necessary yeah on so is the arterial injection casting remains from time to time Something has been done in this facility. They just were hypodermically does. embalming a body. Well, what he's referring to here is that I believe my understanding of his affidavit in whole is yes, they, they did some injections on the body that was there was a photograph for. But in addition to that, I believe Mr. Williams is saying that aspirations are necessary from time to time. And um, I, I'll let the board ask him questions about that, but it really doesn't matter whether it constitutes embalming or not. That, that's an issue that we would get into in the formal hearing when, we're, when the board decides whether or not he's violated the, the, the rules about embalming. <coughs> you know, again, we're focus, focusing on the public health and safety so the point is that whether you're injecting chemicals or pulling these dangerous chemicals out I believe the public health risk is is the same um, and the board is free to go back over these in as much detail as it needs to later but if you would look at exhibit 7 that's the material safety data, sh data sheet for capital series arterial 36. And that's one of the two products that Mr. Bozeman took a photograph of, which is in here. And I if you notice on this, this is a uh, Flammable liquid and vapor, harmful if swallowed, toxic in contact with skin, fatal if inhaled, severe burns. Um, I, I'm not going to spend much time arguing that that's a very yeah. hazardous chemical, and you know that's why the board requires adequate draining and requires ventilation. 
uh, that's you know that's there for a reason so uh, that's a chemical that was found and also there is an MSDS sheet in exhibit 8 for from aldegon which <coughs> excuse me mr. Williams was pointing out to me earlier that the main ingredient in that is merely isopropyl alcohol but either way on that sheet the bottom of the first page of the sheet it <laughs> the manufacturer says danger highly flammable liquid causes serious eye eye irritation, drowsiness, dizziness, um, keep away from heat. And again, th this is being, this is in a room where there's no ventilation. This picture's taken in a lounge? Wait, this okay, you're probably a little bit ahead of me. Let me get to what you're looking at. You're looking at Exhibit 5 photos. She's on Exhibit 2 under the GID. Oh, I'm, I got on five because I thought that's what you'd see. Pictures. Yeah, it, Exhibit 2, there's a photograph in there that Gid Holmes took when he worked there. Uh, exhibit 5 are the photographs taken by Roy Bozeman on June 27th. And on page 1 of Exhibit 5, that's the arterial <coughs> fluid. Then page 2 of the exhibit shows some more, th shows the cabinet above the sink. Uh, number, page three of the exhibit is some more photographs of things on the top shelf. Uh, then you see in the cabinet, there's the Dodge from Aldegon. Uh, uh, page five, that that's on the countertop and those are some, some Things, some, um, it looks to me to be like embalming instruments or something that would. Uh, be which exhibit are you on now? Okay. Ma'am? Which exhibit are you on now? I'm on exhibit five. Okay, you five. sent me back to two now. I'm, no, back, on, back, to I'm two. back on five. I'm back on five. All you right. Were good. Are these photographs taken in this lounge? That was my question to you. That's correct. And you'll also know, notice. Exhibit six, that is, it's called layout. That is a layout of the establishment that was provided to the board when they applied for licensure back in 2012. So you can look at this and the only, you can see uh, two little restrooms that have a sink. So I asked Mr. Bozeman, I sent Mr. Bozeman this diagram and asked him if he could tell me what room he was in and he said that would be what's called the break room. So, uh, kind of, Okay, so there, there you have it. It's in order to to identify, you know, in identifying what is actually a public threat, a, an imminent public threat. It, it's difficult to do that, but uh, the department would suggest that these chemicals, especially the arterial fluid, that's obviously a hazardous substance. I, I believe there's also other tenants in that building. I don't know how the ventilation, if it's a cross system or, or if it's enclosed. Um, I know Mr. Williams does inform me that there is a cross connection. There's a backflow prevention device installed for that facility, but uh, that's, that's the evidence that the department has for you. So. I'll let Mr. Williams 
give you his version of, of the situation and then I'll make a few comments to you in closing. Okay, Mr. Williams. Hi, my name is Rodney Williams, um, licensed funeral director, licensed embalmer in Memphis. Speak a little speak louder, Mr. Williams. Just, you just, might want to raise the microphone up just, just a little Just to give bit. you a little insight on um, this one. This one right here. Just to give you a little insight this on. This is better. Trust me. Just to give you a little insight on um, the inspection that Mr. Bozeman did um, when he came in, the quote break room has been mostly used for storage purposes. Um, when he came in to take pictures, he actually had me and another person to remove everything out of the room so that he could take pictures. So we had to move tires and, and uh, car wash materials, water hoses, everything out of that room to make space to even to get in there to take pictures. So that, that room has not been functional for anything but storage for, for over uh, a year and a half um, or, or more. Um, I think that most, most of the employees uh, there and people who come in to assist will attest that uh, we never really go back there until the guy that comes to wash the cars uh, comes and, and, and uh, we have to take the water hose and open the door and let the water hose out the back so he can wash vehicles. Okay. Uh, let me also state that the picture that is in, depicted in, in that, I'm not sure exactly when it was. I do know that it was at a point um, uh, between the end of 2013, the beginning of 2014, okay, and I'm, I'm aware. I also want you to take note that there is no way that one individual can move a body from the, the hallway, which is a very narrow hallway, in and around to the countertop. It takes more than, it takes more than one person to do that. So I'm not sure of how many people are in the funeral industry. There's no way to, to even get a body position right and properly embalmed to the point to where it'd be a, a, able to be a, a, a good showing uh, embalming on the countertop. Okay. I also want to bring to your attention that the, the picture that was taken by Mr. Bozeman was an empty empty bottle. It was an empty bottle of uh, Arlington chemical. Um, and also that the formaldegon um, I, I even looked up and compared the MSD <coughs> MSDSG to isopropanol solution and alcohol, and and just to find out that that, that they are the same components and they have the same same hazards that uh, either, either alcohol or either rubbing alcohol or even peroxide has on the MSDSG. Pretty much the same, the same chemical or substance that alcohol is made. Of. So that chem that chemical in itself is is not is about as, as hazardous as a bottle of uh, rubbing alcohol. And I'm sure all of us have alcohol in our homes in our closets. Um, I'd like to entertain any in. Oh, before I before I go any further, I would like to also <coughs> state that. The state, uh, the state on the city, state, and the county levels, a backflow prevention is required in all funeral establishments. All much where is using a public water supply in the preparation of body should have in installed reduced backflow preventer assembly for the protection of the public water supply. Now, I, 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 until I got, after I got my license, 
uh, and before, um, after I got issued the establishment license, I got a letter from MLGNW, which I want to say is on the city level, uh, stating I needed to have a backflow preventer that was on the premises um, inspected. And I have had to do that consistently each year. Um, when I found that out, I did, I did begin to aspirate bodies in the facility. I, I did not hide that information from anyone. Uh, I did not um, deny that when Mr. Bowden asked me, because the backflow preventer is on the building to protect the public. Where is it located? It's located in the backflow preventer that we have is located at the entry of the building right at the where, the, where the cold water enters the building. It's a closet in the front of the building. Uh, it, it is inspected each year um, by, uh, by Backflow Sales Company, the company that is an approved company for MLGNW. It states uh, the, the, the test, the serial number of the Backflow Preventer, which is uh, recorded with the MLGNW, which is, uh, which is uh, the agency in charge of cross connection uh, within the city of Memphis and, and some surrounding areas. Um, funeral homes are not the only place that require them, and I, I didn't have to purchase one uh, because it, the building that I am in it was a dentist office, so that the, that item was already already there. Well, this is not a standalone funeral home. No. Are you in some kind of what I mean, you call them? It is in the strip mall. Hey, can can I ask a question? Yes. You were approved in 2012 for this establishment, for this location, yeah. and you stated that all embalming would be done with affordable uh, cremation society mortuary service. Yeah. So this place wasn't approved for embalming of any type yeah. in 2012, was it? No. Okay. No. But no. you're but you're embalming there now. No, I'm not embalming there at all. No, my, the last the my, my inspection showed it, and my inspection from Mr. Baldwin. I'm not sure. What exhibit it is, I'm sure it's on, it's on your record. My inspections indicate with Mr. Bozeman that I, I, in 2012, I used uh, High Point uh, or affordable cremations or, or, or whatever. I used them uh, for cremation, I mean, not for cremation, for uh, the purpose of embalming. And um, at some point, I, I feel like they were trying to, to price gouge me. And so I started using Wolf Brothers Funeral Home in West Memphis. Uh, to embalm it. And then after using Wolf Brothers, then I, I um, started using Calvary Memorial Funeral Home. So in 2012, in, in, in 2012 um, and summer 2013, uh, the embalm was done. In, 20, in 2012 and summer 2013, the embalm was done at Wolf Brothers Funeral Home in West Memphis. But we've got affidavits, don't we, stating that embalming was taking place? Well, I mean, you have affidavits, but those are, and we have pictures. Those are, they, that's an isolated incident. That's one isolated incident. Now, um, the... Where was this picture right here take? Picture? Where was that picture take? That, that picture is taken in, in, in what's, what's depicted as a break room. Why is there an aneurysm hook and cosmetics and other stuff here with the paintbrush? And because we have to, we have to use cosmetics to... to to, to call, we have to. Is this not, you do that in your break room? Well, it's not. That's not considered. That's just on paper a break room. It's not. We don't. We don't have a break room. Why would you have an aspiration device in, in, in a building that was not approved for embalming? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't necessarily think that aspiration was. For the embalming process. Was, was embalming. Yeah. You're you're a, and you're a licensed embalmer. Yeah. Where'd you go to school? That, that's in the same room. Mm -hmm. What is embalming to you? Well, I, I, I would assume in, in my situation that the embalming would be actually the use of an embalming machine injecting arterially. You know, that, that's a major portion of the embalming process. Aspiration. Sanitation and preservation of human remains. So how do you preserve the viscera? How do you preserve the viscera? 
you aspirate it, and you inject cavity fluid back into that viscera. I, I, well, I don't always use cavity chemical. You'll put cavity fluid back into the viscera. I've seen enough. Unless I, unless I feel like the body requires it, uh, I don't. I don't in, in, introduce that. Um, Where is your you have no ventilation now. My I'm sorry. You have no ventilation in that room then. For, for the one member of the board that's not in the funeral business, can someone give me a brief summary of aspiration? It's, it, it's using a trill car hooked up to a device, and the sink uses water pressure to create a suction that yeah. treats the internal witness. hollow organs. Sure. Mr. Batson, what? I bet he would. Sure, yeah, yeah I, I, anyone. That's fun. Yeah, Why witness. Just a short story is fun. I, I think it would just be better to use someone that's not a board Yeah. It's uh, the removal of gases out of the viscerals. Uh, yeah. Well, you do. Wait, microphone. Yeah, microphone. And introduce yourself so everyone, most everyone here knows who Bad uh, Batson go. is. But. Right. Lisa, Lisa, come here, please. Um, yeah, and just use layman's terms if you don't mind because you're okay. speaking to a layman. It's, uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's the use of suction to remove gases from the body cavity, the trunk. Uh, and then you replace those gases and, and fluids that were removed with cavity fluid. Okay. And that's the, the cavity embalming process. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Question for Mr. Clip. What, what's our next step if we find reason to proceed? If, if the board decides that it has identified an immediate threat to the public health, what the threat is to the public and uh, decide whether the board wants to issue a summer license which would be effective until the formal hearing is concluded or unless it's modified by the board My continue. Okay. Now, as I stated, um, the backflow preventer is there, and there's a backflow preventer on. There was a backflow preventer on this instrument right here, which is the aspirator. Okay, so there's a built-in there's a built-in backflow preventer on there to protect the water supply. I'm saying so there was never. There was never in a, a threat to. If you don't embalm, you don't need a back rope. You're not aspirating, I mean, you're not embalming. I'm, I'm going back, I'm reverting back and going forward. So I'm just letting you all know that there was never a threat to the public with regard to aspiration of it. it really, that's just your opinion, though. I mean, <coughs> that's your opinion that there was no threat. But the theoretically, Theoretically speaking, with the with the backflow preventer in the front of the building and the backflow preventer at the aspirator, there, there was no no threat. What about the conditions in that room, the conditions of his body, the lack of sanitation, the lack of respect for that body, uh, the surroundings, this stuff like this, that people are around, just basic sanitation. What about that? That's not a threat to the public. That, that was an isolated incident. What? That was an isolated incident. It was, it was an isolated incident. What's an isolated incident? That, was, that, was, that occurred one time right there in that area. Were, were you present? I was. I was. What about all this stuff that's on top of the cabinets and well, in the cabinets? Is that an isolated incident? As I stated initially, that room is typically used for storage purposes. We, we really do not access that room. Um, the car, when we get ready to wash cars, we, we will connect the hose uh, and, and, and wash the cars in that aspect. But as far as, it, it's like a catch-all drawer. Anyway. That's like you, you, you think more about washing a car than you're about showing respect to a dead human body. Let me just give you a, let me just give you a little uh, outline. Um, are, we dealing, are, we, are we supposed to be dealing with this issue or right now, or, or are we waiting on well, the, the, the issue is whether or not there is 
an imminent threat. Okay. And that I believe she's asking you questions about embalming. We do. Uh, we, I do not embalm okay. in the facility. I have not embalmed. I have not ever arterially embalmed in the facility. What was taking place in the pictures? The one where he, where the body is laid on, on the counter. What's occurring there? Well, we had we had a lot of visitations going to happen the next day. I think it was one, maybe two o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure exactly what time in the morning it was. I I had been, I had been working uh, a lot. I, I was the only person there. Uh, I was making all of the removals, doing all of the embalming, dressing all of the bodies. I was doing everything by myself. I called somebody to help me, and they came to help me. And I, the um, that, that guy uh, was picked up, and I I hadn't heard, heard back from the family. So uh, I didn't. I I just I wanted to go ahead and treat his body, so that the body would not kick up an odor. Have you gotten permission from that family to embalm the body? No, ma'am. I hadn't gotten permission to embalm the body. Okay. I hadn't heard All from right. the family after we after we after we picked the body up. I hadn't heard from the family. You're not aware that that's required by law. This is it's, it's, uh, well. It's, it may be required for them to pay for it. Uh, it's not not no. to pay for it. I said, are you not aware that you're required? to ask them for yes, permission. Yes, if, I could, if I could have reached them in a, a reasonable amount of time, I would have gotten permission. Why did you proceed? That days, had, days had passed. What? Days had passed. Days had passed. In, in one of the affidavits from Mr. Cooper, who used to work for you, he said he witnessed <laughs> approximately 20 bodies being embalmed in the facility. So that couldn't be an isolated incident. Well, I, I, I mean, know. I know that's that's his well, affidavit, but I, 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 I just recently found out about that statement. Now, yeah. are, aren't you the only licensed embalmer for your firm? I am for my firm, but I hadn't, um, I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't, I just saw the affidavit from Mr. Cooper, and, mm -hmm. and 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 I and I don't know if that was coerced. I don't know where that came from. Are, you know? are, is anybody else embalming besides you there? Uh, I don't embalm at Signature. Oh, okay, I understand. I, embalm at, I currently embalm at Calvary Funeral Home. Okay. Looks like Mr. Cooper said he witnessed 20 bodies being embalmed at the let, funeral let, home. Let me give you a little background about Jordan Cooper. Jordan Cooper uh, works at High Point. If he does not work at High Point, he works at a subsidiary company for High Point. High Point at this point is one of my major competitors. I do not understand how Jordan got tied into this. Uh, and in, in those statements uh, that have been made, I do not understand the validity of those statements, okay? The complaint came in from a disgruntled employee who left. Mr. Bozeman came, I spoke to Mr. Bozeman, and then um, days later, uh, this statement popped up, and, and I, I only found out about this statement when I called Mr. Chick and asked him to send me the complete information. So I, those, those are not substantiated accusations, okay? Those are. Do we have a written statement from Mr. Bozeman since he's not present? <coughs> Y'all excuse my voice. Uh, Ma'am, we... we <coughs> you're not being picked up, Mr. Jick. No, Ms. Al, we, we don't have the uh, actual report from Mr. Bozeman, what I did was took out the, the affidavits, this individual standalone affidavits that he obtained and, and the photographs. Um. So, as I stated, embalming is not done at this facility. Um, I did uh, make some adjustments to the back room, which we refer to as the the uh, break room on your your documentation by uh, separating the building, separating that room, taking the sink out, dismantling the, dismantling the sink and the cabinets. So we've dismantled the sinks and the cabinets. We've taken that completely out. We've put a a door between the we put a door between the we put a wall between the door so there's no way to get back to the area it's cut off the only interest is, is from the back the plumbing is capped off and the, and the room is completely 
uh, and then and, and everything else was placed back in there. So there's no, no there's no way to access anything back in that room. I just completely took it out. Since we use it for storage, then I have made it to where it is stored. So there's no way to from the there's no way from to access that room from within the building. You actually have to go outside of the building and go in the back. The shelving, there's shelving in there, and there's no way to there's no way to get anything o over four or five feet in in the room. So there's no way to possibly introduce a body back in that area. Okay, I did that just to alleviate any. I did that to alleviate any thought uh, uh, or concern uh, of, about embalming going on in there, because embalming is done at Calvary Funeral Home. Bodies are casketed at Calvary Funeral Home, <clears throat> and uh, the remains are transported from Calvary to Signature Funeral Center. The chemicals that were present, do you consider those embalming chemicals? They are embalming chemicals, and in some instances, we have to uh, treat some areas of the body hypodermically with the hypodermic syringe. You don't consider that embalming? Well, it, 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 all, it all depends on how you look at it. I'm not sure how many, many you know, funeral professionals are here. Um, uh, but there have been times where all of us would plan our lives. There, we have one public member. There, there have been times where I've had to inject soft tissue that, that was poorly, uh, uh, poorly embalmed, maybe a lip that needed to be tightened up uh, to be able to properly close uh, or glue close that I would inject in the corner of the lip to, to, to firm up so that I could get a proper closure and a good, a good cosmetic application. So basically, you're just doing touch up work. With, with, yes. After they've been casketed. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, does anyone else have any questions for me? In the affidavit, it stated that you did aspiration at this facility. I, I, I did. I did. I have done aspirations at the facility. Yes. I, I'm not I don't think that's part of the embalming process. I'm not currently aspirating body at that facility. I have not had to do. I have not had to do anything with regard to embalming in that facility since I have been at Calvary Funeral Home. They have a full. Uh, this is not Calvary. This is Signature. Yes, ma'am. You said Calvary. That's why I embalm. How long? I've been embalming since '99. Oh, um, end of 2013, beginning of 2014. Okay, so maybe I missed something. So you opened in 2012? Yes. So where were you embalming? Uh, initially, yes. the embalming was done at High Point. High Point, and then you went to Calvary. Then I went to Wolf Brothers Funeral Home. They, allowed, they actually allowed me to come in and embalm bodies there myself. So... So the first place that you went, someone else did your embalming yes. initially? Yes. Okay. For a fee. Okay. And you know, fee, the fee changed, you know, depending on what what was going on. It was it was it, it was it was overbearing for me, so I had to I had to do something different, you know. And so I call, um, called Mr. Wolf and he allowed me to come over and use their facility and do my own embalming there. And then uh, and then after that, uh I, I met the Keisha Weston, who allowed me to come to her father's funeral home in Embalm. Did it ever occur to you to possibly put in a Embalm a preparation room in your firm? It did, but the, the, the building is so small. It's just really small, and and um, you know, even actually in the process uh, of purchasing. Uh, property or, or beginning to get certification for the property to be zoned so that we can have a larger large facility yeah keep we keep just keep this in mind when I opened up this funeral home I didn't ex I opened it up because I needed something to do I needed a job I didn't expect to be as busy as I am so soon you know I didn't expect to to uh, exhaust myself to the point to where uh, I needed help and 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 in Memphis, it's just hard. Funeral directors just were, are, are not supportive of me. They, they, I, it was hard for me to get the help that I needed. It was hard. 
between my first opening up until it was just hard for me to get the help I need. I had to call as far as Arkansas or Jackson, Tennessee to get help for what I needed to, you know, done. I'm just one person. Uh, I, I don't know a lot of people here, and and uh, to a certain and uh, to up until a certain point, uh, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed, and did you serve your apprenticeship? I served my apprenticeship in Arkansas. My original license is an Arkansas license. I served my apprenticeship at the Ackland Funeral Home in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, at that. When I uh, graduated from mortuary school, I moved there. I think uh, when Ackland was here, they were on South Third Street, and that's where I started uh, there. They and then he closed the funeral home, and I moved when I graduated in '97. I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. Well, of course, there they it was one of the largest funeral homes there at the time. Uh, they had all the equipment, everything they needed, and the people. You know, my question to myself was, where did all, where do all, where do, where does your help come from? Where do people come from? You know, because I need some help. <laughs> I was needing help, and so. Um, you'd be surprised. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm surprised myself at, at how far I came in such a short time doing everything by myself. And I, I've had friends um, just to pop up, and I, I've had friends that come from Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, Mr. Ross here, he's a licensed funeral director in Little Rock. I, I, I think he just went home for the first time in, in, in uh, a month because he, he comes over and he makes sure everything is taken care of. Uh, making sure that I can I can get the rest I need so I can be fresh and refreshed and renewed so I can be able to move about. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I thought I won't have a heart attack because I was just overwhelmed. I had to take two weeks off. I took two weeks off to to uh, try to recuperate from the. What pressure. overwhelmed you? Volume, call volume. What? The call volume. We uh, the call volume. The number of calls that we received. How many have you had? Um, from January, from September to now, we're what? 320. 320 calls um, from January up until today. 320 calls. There's no, there, there. Actually, 322. Three, 322. There's no way I could actually do that by myself. If it were, if it wasn't for, for one, one for Dakeisha, who allows me to come and embalm and who helps me. Uh, if it wasn't for Chris Ross, who, who leaves his home. For months at a time to come over here and make sure that I got the help I need. And if it weren't for Dion, the office manager, who makes sure that all the paperwork and everything is in order, that all the fly, files are compliant, that makes that makes everything flow smoothly, it gives me the opportunity to get the proper rest and and everything that I need to do. But but up until this point, it, that the day of that picture right there, I, I I had been up three days. I was frustrated. I had to leave there. After that, go somewhere else, dress bodies. Uh, put them in the casket and get ready for the next day, the visitation day. All because I had been picking up bodies, talking on the phone, it, meeting with families, all of that by myself. It, hospice nurses, so they ask me, do I have any help? And I tell them, no, I don't have help. Well, they, you know, uh, we always see you up all the time, you know. Another thing is, another thing is the calls that we get, everybody doesn't have what they need to take care of their business. Uh, I don't tell the hospital nurse I'm not coming until the family has until I know the family has some money. Sometimes they call and I get up out of my bed and know that I don't have any promise of any money. That I may have to hold that body until I get the county approval to bury in the county cemetery. But but nobody else will get out of their bed and pick up a body and hold the body and let the hospital nurse move on to the next dying patient. I I I, I do that. You know, it, I, I'm not, I didn't open this funeral home to get rich. I didn't open it. I opened this funeral home to provide a living for myself and to help families, the families that we serve. And the families that we serve, most of them don't have, don't, don't even have what they need to do what they want to do. Most of them don't even have money for a cremation. I keep on, I have lost more. I have lost more from having this business uh, than, I, than, I, than I can retain. I have to keep on moving. I can't hold somebody and say, well, we're just going to keep them here until you come up with the money. I move on. I continue to move on to the next group of people. And so the incident that occurred with that, that body right there, get homes. Hey, man, you need to come on. Let's come on. Put this body in here. 
go ahead and hype on them. Let's go ahead and get them, get them bagged up and put in in the cold room. And, and so we can go ahead and get everything situated. I'm tired. I say, okay, let me, let's, let's do it. You know, let's do it. Let's get it out the way so we can move on to tomorrow. It wasn't, it wasn't a mode of disrespect or anything. It, it was just, it was just a means to an end. I had, I, I was trying to get to the bed, you know. It's, it's not a common practice for me to do things like that. You know, if, any, if anybody, if you ask anybody present or not present, I care about what I do. I do everything I can to make sure that everything is perfect. We've been open, we've had 500, 530, 40, 40 cases since 2012, 540 cases. Look at the amount of complaints that you all have had on our establishment and look at the, the substantiation of those complaints. It's not indicative of <clears throat> what's being depicted in those affidavits that you all have. I, didn't, I don't have a reason to lie on my affidavit, everything in my affidavit. I, I, I readily brought forward and said, yes, this happened. Yes, this occurred. Yes, this occurred. This is why this occurred. This is why that occurred. If, I, if I'm wrong, let me know I'm wrong. Let, give me, find me. Let me continue to move on. But as far as today, there is no way for us to embalm in the building. There is no imminent danger or threat to the public. There is no imminent or, or present danger to the staff, the employees in that facility. Are these items still in that room? No, the room is, is completely empty and walled off. There, there is no, there is no plum, there is no plumbing. Plumbing is kept off. This is the door to the outside. This is the door on the inside. This is the other side of the door. Everything is completely walled off. The sink, the cabinets, the countertop, everything is, I'm not even sure if they're still there. They may, they may be trashed by now. But uh, just, just, to, just to shine any appearance of wrongdoing, I just rather take all of that out and, and, and do away with it so I can continue to so I can continue to, to provide a living for myself, my family and the families of the people who help uh, help me and the people who work for me and the people who take months off at a time to come and make sure that I'm okay. I, it, it kind of a comment too. I, I think one of the things that we need to pay attention to is that apparently Maybe the safer thing to do is to, so maybe the safer thing to do is to ask Mr. Williams whether or not he has done aspirations and whether he will continue to do aspirations because if he doesn't believe that's embalming, then it could be misleading if he says I'm not going to bomb him anymore. So I, I think the board needs to know as far as if it's going to be a continuing threat, is he going to aspirate bodies? anymore at that place. Taking out the aspiration equipment so in the sink. So I don't guess he is going to do that. I mean, he doesn't have any other where he could there. <laughs> is that correct, yeah, Mr. Wayne? Yeah, it's most accurate, yes. Um, Good afternoon. My name is Dakisha Weston. I'm a licensed funeral director uh, here in, in Embalmer in Tennessee. Uh, I, my concern is um, the affidavit that was written by Mr. Get Holmes. My major concern is if he was so concerned with the public safety, why did he wait till after he left the facility and um, quit the facility to make this report? If he was so concerned, you should have handed your resignation and, and, and told somebody. As well as Mr. Jordan, I'm not understanding until after the fact that you bring this up after you're a disgruntled employee, you're concerned about public health and public safety. Why wasn't this addressed before now? Quick question for the state. So if, if it were decided that there was no imminent public health issue, do the violations that have been presented to us today still come at a later date? Yes, yes. All, all these things that we've been talking about, they'll be 
hammered out. Those, will still be, those would still be dealt with. Yes. Yes. Th- this is just basically deciding, is this an ongoing thing that is da- endangering the public? Right. Okay. We have a report or anything in these affidavits, which I haven't really had time to look at as like much as I'd like to, that this is ongoing. The only thing that we've got, uh, there's nothing in the affidavits that say it's ongoing. In fact, the affidavits, at least one of them I'm thinking of, indicates that it's not done anymore. So what what the state presented to you that would show it's ongoing was simply the presence of the chemicals and the tools that were found by Mr. Bozeman on the 27th. Oh. And, and that... Oh, what? And the fact that the respondent doesn't appear to believe that there's anything wrong with aspirating. So the, those two things are what the board could look at and find an imminent threat from. But, of course. Is there a, a recommendation from council? Uh, I think the department is going, going to... Um, just leave it totally uh, up to the board. It's it, again, it's simply a matter of whether or not the board believes that these things are likely to, to continue. If if the board does not believe they're likely to continue in the immediate future, then the board should not issue. The board could also, I suppose, it, issue an order. Uh, Clarifying that there, that he's not to do any aspirations or anything. That's that's totally up to the board, and that might be something Miss Richardson. There are also three licenses to consider. That's right. At this hearing, there is the establishment license of signature, and then Mr. Williams's two licenses: his funeral director license and his embalming license. So the board can act differently for each of those, depending on how they apply the, fa- the facts to those specific licenses. A, another def- possibility. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. No, no. I was just curious. When, when will the formal hearing be? If that were to occur, it would probably take place uh, within two months of. Okay. Of now. It would depend a, on another thing. The the board some could. could soon. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, that's fine. I was saying it would depend on a couple of factors, but we would try and do it as quickly as possible. Okay. But it would probably be three months, maybe. The board, I suppose, could also do some type of a hybrid order saying that it won't be suspended now but there's going to be unscheduled unannounced inspections that will be paid for or not paid for that's another kind of possibility that the board could use to reassure itself that there's not a public health concern oh it's the last date the uh, board Inspector was suppressed on the property. Twenty fourteen, July twenty seventh. I know, and he might have gone back after that. Yeah, he, to, he, he, he came back. Um, he came back the following Monday, I believe. Conditions were as they are presented. Yeah, yes, they. No, no, the, the conditions were fine. Let, let me keep this in mind. We've been inspected three times by Mr. Bozeman. There's no way for me to be pinpoint accurate on when Mr. Bowman gonna walk through the door, and all of our and all of my reports are indicative of everything being perfect and in order when he comes from the from the files to everything. When Mr. Bowman comes, he he walks through the entire building. He go, opens every closet. He looks in every door, oh. and everything has always been pristine when he has come there. Everything has always been pristine. So I'll, I'll add that I believe on the, the maybe the last visit by Mr. Bozeman, I think that was to collect some information about some other less serious allegations in the complaint or, or ones that didn't. Everything here yeah. boils from the complaint, not from the original inspections when he passed it. Right. It's all from we're, possibly two. We're here simply employees. because okay. of of the allegations and finding the the supplies still in the break rooms. What what was the deal? I'm curious about 
he said that, uh, Mr. Williams said that Mr. Bozeman had him remove everything from that room before he took the pictures. I, I don't understand that. Why would you not take a picture of the way um, the room was? Sorry, I can speak to that. He, there were a couple pictures that he took before everything was removed, but when he spoke to me, he was saying he was trying to take everything out so you could make sure it was the same building, the same location. You could actually see the counter where the body was. Um, but there was at least one picture, I'm sure we can go back and find, before he'd taken things out. But that was what he told me his intent was in removing those items. Just so you could look at the two pictures side by side and tell, yes, this is the same room, because if there's a bunch of stuff in it. Yeah, so. Well, my only, my only problem with that is if you walk in kind of unannounced and the room is packed full of tires and everything, then that's pretty well conducive that you're not doing kind of embalming in the, or hypoing or whatever. Now, I don't know if you have to clean that out every time, but that's my only concern about having him remove everything from the way it was. <laughs> Perhaps I should. Or staging. <laughs> I, I don't recall, uh, maybe Ms. Richardson recalls whether or not there was a photograph that showed a lot of th clutter in the room. I believe there was Okay, in his then inspection report. I didn't intentionally leave that out, I, I, but perhaps I, I should have left it in there. Yeah. Um, and as I, as I, and I'd like to reiterate, Mr. Bozeman has inspected this facility at this point, officially, officially by report, in 2012, initially when he opened it up, in 2012, in 2013, and in 2014, when he has come, everything, files, paperwork, soap in the bathroom, tissue in the bathroom, paper, everything on that list, uh, price list, everything. There, there are no, there was nothing wrong each time he came. There's no way for me to be pinpoint accurate about when he's coming. Uh, we're very busy. Uh, we move a lot, but we but we maintain everything that we do. Um, I spend a lot of I spend more time at Calvary Funeral Home than I do at Signature. She may spend more time at Signature than I do at Signature. Um, but this, what you what's, what's been de the character that's been depicted of me, is not me. Uh, I may have done things that I didn't understand. I could do or couldn't do. Uh, like I said, when I noticed the, uh, the backflow was in, it was in there, I said, oh, well, I guess I can aspirate in here, you know? But you, I've been told that I cannot do this. And since I have been directed not to do this, then I won't do this. There is, there is no, in my, if you read my affidavit, my affidavit states, yes, this happened. Yes, this occurs. Because I because he asked me, and those are based on the questions that I, I assume that, that the council gave him to ask me. And I answered those questions uh, accordingly. Uh, is this happening? Yes, it is. Uh, is this happening? Yes, it is. Uh, is it still happening? No, it's not. So I have introduced chemical by way of hypodermic injection on bodies. I have um, used uh, um, the hydro aspirator. I have. I've done that. I didn't deny that. It, it's easy as it could have been for me to say, I've never seen that picture before. Oh, he saged that. Oh, he made that up. Oh, he did that. I chose not to take that route because that's not my character. My character is to let you know what's going on that you tell me what I did wrong, that you make a determination on uh, if I'm going to be fined or, or if we're going to have a hearing, uh, and, and move on. And that's really, at this point, that's really all I, I wish to do. I wish to continue to operate our business in the same manner which we have been operating. We have, we have three, four families, maybe plus, to get back to, uh, to make sure that they can be cremated and buried. And 
we just really want to go back home and continue to care for the families that call on us to serve them and to take care of them. The ones that want to do something with their loved ones. They cannot otherwise afford to do it. That's all, that's all we want to do. And uh, I assure you, I'm not running from anything. I've been doing, I've been doing this for 20, 21 years now. I'm not running from anything. <coughs> I, I'm my own person. I'm responsible for my own mistakes. I'm responsible for my own actions. And I take responsibility for that. But we are not embalming in that facility. Uh, we have not used that back room for a long time. Uh, the, the furthest we go in is where you saw the makeup kit. <laughs> we might walk in, <laughs> look for the right color lipstick because the family don't like this color lipstick. Going to the aneurysm. That's, that's the cosmetic kit you use all the time. Well, yeah, yes, ma'am. That's, that's one of the cosmetic kits that we use. Most of the, in that condition all the time. No, no, ma'am, it's not. Most of the most of the cosmetics are over in at Calvary. <laughs> most of the cosmetic, most of everything is done over there. When a family comes in and says we don't like this color lipstick, we have to go and do that. If the eye comes open, we have to use an aneurysm hook. What's an aneurysm hook? If the eye comes open, we have to use an aneurysm hook to clean the glue off and re-glue the eye. You know, it's certain instruments that we need to have to be able to do those things. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I do. I, I have, and speaking as, but, you know, I have uh, tweezers, aneurysm hook. I do 90% of the makeup. Well, that's wrong. Probably 50% of the makeup at the location. We do not maintain an embalming room there. I have no chemicals, nothing, but we do have a dressing room. But sometimes you have to reposition the mouth, which you need an aneurysm hook, a pair of tweezers, you know, some cotton, and uh, the cosmetics. So, you know, having an aneurysm hook, I know you use an aneurysm hook in embalming, but I use an aneurysm hook. I, I never embalm anymore. Uh, but I use an aneurysm hook probably several times a week. So, you know... Uh, for those that do cosmetics and uh, on a regular basis, I think uh, the aneurysm hook is, a, in my case, I use quite a bit because I will reposition the mouth, I will reposition the, uh, <laughs> and sometime. And the aneurysm hook also has a little flat thing on the end of it where if you are redoing the eyes, uh, you know, that helps me. So. Um, oh, man. I'm from the old school too, Bob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> also, I, I, I got all of this. I, I give I get this jump drive to him and let you all look through what I have here, uh, if you all need to uh, at a later date. But Georgia, I mean, even looking at the state of Georgia and their and what they require funeral homes to have, they even require funeral homes without a preparation room to have uh, equipment to do hydro aspiration. So that's one, I mean, Georgia gives you a list. They, you have to have two needles, two cannulas. You have to have this, 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 and that. You know, they give you a breakdown. And if you don't have 24 bottles of chemical, uh, if you don't have 24 bottles of cavity, then you get, you get fined for that. Those are, those are, uh, are things that Georgia requires, which, which was gonna lead me to ask you, uh, and, and Mr. Starkey, you, based on what you just said, also, I need to know what am I allowed to have in the building. What what am, what chemical am I allowed to have? Dry wash? Am I allowed to have? Uh, uh, what what chemicals am I allowed to have in the building? If if I if I have a lip that that may not be uh, uh, fully fully embalmed that I need to inject, or that I need to inject with a uh, a hypodermic needle. You know, do I have to take the body out of the funeral home all the way back to Calvary? do that and then bring the body all the way back. You know, what, what, what options do I have? What, what options do I have? I need to know that before I leave today because I need to make sure that whatever uh, you all said before me today is, is complied with. And I need to let the people who, who assist in that aspect know what we can and cannot do. I'm, I'm really, I, I've really been accustomed to having everything I needed in one place under one roof. 
And like I said, when I open this small establishment up, I didn't expect to be doing the volume that I am doing. I have now that I have the help that I need. Now that I have everything uh, that I need to move forward. Now that I have gotten rid of the people who caused me the most trouble <coughs> and problems. I got you got a licensed funeral director here. You got uh, Arkansas licensed funeral director here, soon to be Tennessee licensed. And then you got uh, Arkansas, a, a brand new. Uh, well, he's about to sit for the Arkansas uh, funeral board. And he has how many experience? How many years of experience do you have? He has 15 years of experience in the industry. He's about to be licensed once you take your test. When you take your test? Uh, in, in November. Uh, so I got I got people who are, are familiar with the industry and are advancing in the industry uh, that that want to see something small grow. Uh, I need to know what we can have, what we can't have, since we don't have in that building a prep room. Since we don't have a prep room, are we allowed to have the dry wash? You know, <clears throat> are we allowed to have the formaldehyde? What, what is that rule, Mr. Gribble? I'd be curious myself. <laughs> I don't think it's spelled out, and I don't know that you want to spell it out here today either. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, I mean, embalming's embalming. If you're not embalming, then you're not embalming. And I think you would look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and make a determination. And I don't think that there's a general checklist of what you would and wouldn't have, is, is my personal opinion. Well, I, th I think the big thing is certain things, when you do cosmetics, you have to have. Uh, dry wash is something I have to use religiously with cosmetics because it removes oil, it removes cosmetics if you overextended them so you know I I, I don't know uh, and, and this is not the time to discuss it maybe but that would be an interesting uh, perspective maybe of what is allowed and what's not allowed might be something you want to look at as a board when you do rulemaking yeah. yeah the only laws and rules I'm aware of are embalming you have to you have to embalm in a prep facility and the materials are just there what you need when you need it and if you have materials and I don't know if you're doing embalming you need embalming materials and that's just the issue is are you embalming there or are you not well I would I would tell Mr. Williams this if a body needed to have arterial fluid injected in it for preservation then it needs to be done in a a duly licensed facility because it is formaldehyde you are not allowed we have no formaldehyde in our building we have no cavity fluid in our building we have a dressing room but we uh, and we supposedly meet meet the codes on that so uh, but uh, that's used and it should be in a facility that's licensed to be done in that facility. I ask you a question in your affidavit or about the third page of it it says caskets have been reused for the purpose of viewing and funerals when cremation is the disposition Yes, ma'am. Sal, that, that's not one of the issues that we were addressing today because it. Huh? No, no problem. You know, I, I listen to you, Mr. Williams, and, and as we're all funeral directors with the exception of Mr. Cochran, you know, we admire a funeral director who's serving, taking care of families. You're obviously very good at it because you've got a good case volume. Um, we're here just to protect, to regulate funeral homes and to protect the general public. And I think the state brought us a case that we needed to look at as a board to make sure that the general welfare of the public is taken care of. And, and I think we're charged today to determine whether there's an imminent threat. And so it, this isn't personal. We're just trying to do our business to protect all the funeral homes in the state. And the public. And, and the public. That's what we're charged here to do. And, uh, you know, we, 
our rules and regulations are different from Georgia and Arkansas and Mississippi and everybody else. We've got to take care of Tennessee. And, and I, as a board, that's what we have to do. And, and there, there's not an easy solution, not an easy fix, not an easy answer. But, you know, board, that's what we're charged to do, and that's what the state's presented with us. In my, in my final statements, um, embalming is not currently being done in the building. Uh, all, all avenues for embalming in any aspect, whether it be aspiration, hypodermic injection, or what have you, uh, will not be done in that facility. The, the break room uh, allegedly used for embalming uh, purposes has been dismantled and all the plumbing removed and capped off and it's completely separated from the interior of the building, meaning that you have to go out to the back to access the building for storage purposes. Shelving is included in there and there's no way to get anything in uh, or out. Uh, and will be accessible to the inspector when he comes in. The person who has a key to the front door has a key to that door. So they'll be able to give him full access to the building as we always have had. All the inspections that we have ever had have not been indicative of anything that has been indicated in those reports with regard to what goes on in the facility. There's never been an odor of chemical. There's never been an odor of body. There's never been anything like that indicated in the reports that have been issued to you by Mr. Bozeman. Um, there, in my opinion, there, there is not an imminent debt to the public safety, and I, I'd like to rest on that. I don't have anything further either. I, I guess the board just needs to vote whether or not you want to issue a summary. Keep in mind there are three separate licenses right. to consider. One, one, one more thing also, uh, there, there is no chemical. All chemical has been removed uh, from the facility as well. And Mr. Bowman is welcome to come by and inspect it at his, at, at his convenience. We need to discuss this as a board. What do we think some of the options are? What's what's the make a field rep should go back and do another inspection to make sure everything is in the ordered way? What he's telling us, I think what we're dealing with here, as uh, Mr. Cheek said, is strictly imminent danger. I mean, that's all he's asked us to do. It's not to try the case or anything, but to deal. With Mr. Williams has tried to reassure us that 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 danger has been removed since the plumbing's been taken out. I mean, so I, I, I admire him doing that, uh, taking care of that issue. I, I agree. I think he's provided provided some evidence to show that that, that, that imminent threat has, has been removed. I I'm, am also for, though, you know, having some, some inspections take place in the next few months, what, periodically. What is the evidence that he's done all that? Um, what I was referring to were the were the exhibits uh, Mr. Williams presented where basically he was showing that the sink cabinets, basically all things that could even possibly be used in that room have been removed. I don't have a photograph of the room, do we? Yeah. I, 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 can, I, can leave this, I can leave this with him. I can leave, I can leave this with him. If you like. have a photograph of the room inside yes. the room? Yes. I'd like to see that. I really think he's been he's been truthful and forthcoming and given an explanation because what I've seen <laughs> if there were no explanation <laughs> that's a door Mr. Williams Can you I see need to see angle? inside the room I see a bucket on the floor and a looks like an ice chest or something I don't know what this right Fires there. These are these are the tires that we took out when Mr. Bowman came to access removal. This Do you I have a picture of the room? There's you no say it's completely empty. There's no way to get a, a picture of the room because it's it's so small. It's, it's small. Is that it's where the sink small. was? The, the, the line on the wall. Right oh. the it's a right look, countertop. The counter. Yeah. 
Okay. Oh, so it's a very, very small room. Right, right. It would oh, take, okay. I would, uh, you would actually have to pick a person up. Two people would have to pick a person up and squeeze around the corner to even get a body in there. You know, so you, you, you would actually have to, to see it to understand it. And, and Why did you take that body in there? Because, because in that instance, I took the body in there because I was one tired. And two, the person who turned the complaint in, it was his idea to go ahead and let's get through so we can go home. And being being tired, exhausted almost up three days, uh, of course I said, okay, let's get it done. You know, not knowing that when I left, he took a picture of it. You know, uh, and it, we we and, and we'll get to we'll get to the our background. We'll get to our background. And and and, 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 and if you all ever want to talk to me about that, or if we need to talk about, it, we'll get into the background of Rodney Williams and Gary Holmes at a later date, um, but it was his idea. I was tired. I, I, used, I did what he suggested to do so we can go home. And, to come, and, and we had to come back the next day without any added issues, you know. Ms. Richardson, I had a quick question. So before I make or, or vote on a motion, does the formal hearing occur either way? Regardless if we yes. say the license is summarily suspended there or not. There will be a formal hearing there, to discuss all the issues. And this is just public health, safety and, welf safety and welfare, immediate harm. The other hearing, which will be as soon as we can, as soon as reasonable after this, will address all the other allegations of violations in Got this it. complaint. Okay. This was brought to us today because the legal department feels the imminent danger and harm is still present and does exist. Are you asking, the, excuse me, are you asking the department if the department believes that? If the legal department believes well, that that's, there's sufficient uh, evidence that it still exists. That's I'm a question of fact. That that's for the board, which is yeah. the jury in this case, to decide. Also, this is the this is the entrance from the inside of the building going to the the room in the back. It's walled off right there. So it is walled off. Right oh, there. to the left of there is where the door was going in there. Right. Okay, I can see the sheetrock now. I couldn't see where you were saying. Okay, so that is no longer accessible accessible from, from the funeral home part. Per se. Okay. So basically, we're just looking at one issue, and then you have put things in place to uh, put all that to rest. I just want to shun any appearance of wrongdoing uh, for the time being until I, I, because I haven't even been informed of a formal complaint regarding this matter. I haven't received a formal complaint regarding this matter, which, which, is, when, when, which is strange to me because this is the first instance I've received information about a, a complaint before a complaint. Um, which, which, which the state apparently felt it appropriate to do, and and I acknowledge that. I've been I'm just been trying to be co as cooperative as, po as possible with this, and um, but this is a the, the, to me, this room has been the only issue. This is the thorn in my side. This room right here, this one room, and since this has been a thorn in my side, I, I have, uh, you know, I, I've completely dismantled it and done away with it. That way, it's not an apparent issue. Um, we can use it for the purposes uh, of storage. I can put some shelves in here. We can put whatever we need to on there on on that shelf, and we can store the tires and everything else on the other side of the building. Just as one board member, I think we've got a lot of issues here that need to be addressed. But I think today, uh, the imminent threat. I think he's proven that it's been removed. And I think that's what we're here to, today to, you know, to take action on. You know, I, there's plenty of things in this case that jump out at you that, that did a lot of wrongdoing. But I don't, just my opinion, I think the imminent threat has been removed. I agree. I agree, I agree. as well. So, I mean, so, I mean, if a motion were to be made, um, I mean, I guess, so, I guess it might be, I'm not making this motion yet, I, but it, perhaps it would be my suggestion that we, say you know we reject the, the the immediate summary suspension of the license with unannounced inspections to take place from now until the time of the formal hearing was that something that would be does that sound like a reasonable suggestion 
I would agree yes, with I that. Yes, I would agree so. I would agree. Could I get the – could I ask that the board address it separately that – Perhaps there should be one motion on whether or not the suspension should be done, and then another motion about each license, like each license separately. Well, I mean, I think if the board is going to treat them all the same, then the board could just say we. Someone could make a motion that the board will not take emergency action against any of the three licenses. You know. If that's what it wants to do. It, it could be on all in one motion as long as you include everything or multiple okay. motions, whatever. So, I mean, I, I'll, I'm willing to make that motion on all three licenses, reject immediate suspension or have whatever the legal term, summary suspension of the license with the contention that there will be unannounced inspections from now until the time of the informal hearing. He wants that as a separate motion. Oh, no, 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 go is, ahead. That's is, fine. is that all? Is that okay together? And um, so, if that's okay with, with Miss Richardson, if she feels like that's proper. Second it. Fine. I have a motion for Mr. Cochran, a second for Ms. Taylor, and uh, all uh, proceedings this time we take a, a roll call. So, Ms. Mosley, if you'll call the roll, please. Mark Cothran. Aye. Robert Helms. Yes. David Neal. Yes. Jane Gray Sal. No. Oh. Robert Starkey. Yes. Anita Taylor. Yes. Mr. President, we have five yes and one no. Motion carries. So would you read the, uh, read what you have to make sure it's in compliance with what we the just The motion voted on. was to reject the summary suspension for all three licenses and have unannounced inspections until the formal hearing. Is that right? Okay. Point of clarification so we have a good understanding. On reinspections, there's a $200 fee, and typically when, when there's an order from the board to do the reinspections, we assess the, the, the fee. Typically, we do those once a quarter until the formal hearing. Is that, I just want a good understanding from the board and from so Mr. Can Williams. Go on for four months or three more months without being inspected. Talking about the, the billing is yeah, quarterly, yeah, is that correct? <laughs> the typically what we would and, and I'm asking for guidance. I'm just asking what what your thoughts are. Typically what we do is have at least one inspection during each calendar quarter. We bill for each inspection we do. When we've done this with cemeteries and things like that on the barrel services side, we do an unannounced inspection once per calendar quarter and bill for that according According that to was that. also included in that order yeah. as well. The ones he's talking about, we said, all right, well, the settlement we had, like, okay, you had this issue, we'll settle this, but you agree to unannounced inspections per quarter for two years. And so that's how we've done it in the past. And I'm not sure, Mr. Williams, we will try and do the formal hearing as soon as possible. So I've been notified. I've um, been notified and able to respond to it. Yes, the, the notice of hearing charges has not been filed yet. That would that will happen. No, I haven't been formed. I haven't been I haven't been, been issued uh, and able to reply to. Uh, I haven't had I haven't had been formally. I don't have a formal complaint. Well, and, and I'll speak is, I'll speak to that. The reason he doesn't have a formal complaint is when we get a complaint like this where the activity unlicensed activity is alleged. If we send it out for a response, then obviously all the everything's going to be removed by the time our inspector gets there. So the protocol. For this is you send the inspector. He will be given a notice of the. Of the so well, mis, when Mr. Bozeman visited you, um, he informed you that Mr. Holmes had filed this complaint, oh. and then we, if you have not gotten the full copy yet, we will get that to you. I, I think I've given Mr. Williams everything. Yeah, you what you had. That that should be everything, but I'll get with Mr. Chick and make sure. Yeah, I would like if I could get a formal. Mm -hmm. With cover letter and everything, just if I can get something formal so I can have, you know, it can. Well, I'd like to keep. You it want up. you want something immediately, but you want us to put off everything else. No, I'm well, not. that's what you just said. No, I just I just want a form. I just want a, I just want a formal 
Yeah, when when the formal hearing is done, he will be given the proper notice and given everything, so it will all be taken care of. Just summary suspension, and we get a photograph like this. Our procedure is a little different because of the possibility of destroying the evidence. Do we need to take any kind of action about who's assessed the charges for the, or are we clear on that? I mean, that's, uh, the, the, that happens anyway, right? Right. It, well, the state will pay it. I, I mean, since it's not, this isn't a, wasn't a formal hearing, then the board couldn't assess cost to anyone else. All I was talking about was reinspection fees. There's a rule that says the reinspection fee is $200, and I would just, I just wanted a good understanding between the board and Mr. Williams and, and her office to make sure that that's. Well, if he's inspected twice a year, he's going to be two hundred more dollars then. If he's inspected within twice in a year's time, you're going to be an additional. At each inspection, he gets an inspection fee. fee for you know that inspector's so he, time. You need to understand he's going to be charged two hundred dollars if Mr. Bolton goes back in three weeks or four weeks or a month from now, whatever, two months. from each time, yes, there would be a bill for that up until the formal hearing. It, that's what I understood the board to say is to do the inspection until the formal hearing takes place. Oh, I have a choice. Yeah. So I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay if if, that's, if 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 I'm assessed a fee, then and I pay I pay the fee that I'm assessed if everybody else pays. You know, if if the, if the next man pays it, I pay it. If the person you don't want to follow the yeah. rules that everybody else. I want to Does. I want to follow every rule. Well, you haven't been. I want to follow the rule. I want to follow every rule. So, so yeah, I mean, I think what we just, we've got to make sure that's clear. So there's, there might be, there, there are going to be some inspections that would not have occurred otherwise. And so you will be billed for those. Is that understood? That's understood. Okay. Is that correct? Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, board members. I, I appreciate it. I know it's been kind of a long process, but I think the board did did a great job and I appreciate Mr. Williams too. He was very forthcoming. Yeah. Thank you. Summary suspension hearings over and um, Mr. Chick will get with you, Mr. Williams, about everything for the formal hearing.